This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We head now to Ramallah in the occupied West Bank, where Israeli soldiers and settlers have killed at least 55 Palestinians in the West Bank since Hamas's surprise attack on Israel October 7. Israeli authorities have also arrested over 700 Palestinians, several prominent lawmakers, including Aziz Dweik, the Speaker of the Palestinian Legislative Council. To talk about the situation in the West Bank and the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, we're joined by Sari Bashi, program director at Human Rights Watch, co-founder of Gisha, the leading Israeli human rights group promoting the right of freedom of movement for Palestinians in Gaza. Um, sorry, if you can talk about uh, the entire situation, the imminent invasion of Gaza, you just heard Raji Sarani, and also talk about what's happening in the West Bank. In the last year, uh, approximately, it's a bit more, but a Palestinian a day has been killed since the beginning of the year. Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry to say that since October 7th in Gaza, Israeli airstrikes have killed on average 100 children a day. And that's the statistic that stays with me. So um, this latest escalation began on October 7th when Hamas-led fighters entered uh, Israel and committed unspeakable war crimes against Israeli civilians. They massacred partygoers at an outdoor dance party. They entered homes, uh, in some cases burning the homes, in other cases shooting families. And they took hostage uh, men, women, older people, children, people with disabilities. Appropriately, the U.S. government and people in the United States condemned those acts because they were unspeakable crimes against civilians that have no justification. So the answer cannot be for the Israeli government, with the backing of the American government, to then target and harm civilians in Gaza. I'm particularly concerned about the collective punishment of civilians in Gaza. Um, the Israeli military cut food, electricity, water and fuel supplies on October 7th, uh, which is contributing to the humanitarian catastrophe. And the Israeli military is engaging in, um, is dropping explosive weapons in densely populated areas with wide area effects. So when you do that, when you drop bombs on uh, crowded urban centers, it is predictable that you will kill civilians. It is predictable that you will kill children. And that's what's happening. Gaza is the size, about the size of the U.S. city of Philadelphia. It's 2.2 million people. Nearly half of those people are children. And that's something that we need to see more of the United States government addressing. We've heard thus far um, general uh, comments about the need to respect international humanitarian law. We need very specific directives for the Israeli government to immediately restore fu food, fuel, electricity, and water supplies, and to stop dropping weapons in densely populated civilian areas. And sorry, Bashi, I wanted to ask you, the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has urged uh, pa the Palestinians in Gaza uh, to, uh, to flee to Egypt if they, uh, if they want to avoid uh, the, the horrors of the bombing and the invasion. Uh, isn't this itself uh, uh, the, uh, a form of ethnic cleansing? After all, Israel is not telling the Palestinians, hey, if you want to escape the bombing and the invasion, move into uh, into Israel or be transported to the West Bank. After all, uh, even Putin in his invasion of Ukraine ended up admitting 1.2 million Ukrainians into Russia to avoid the, the worst uh, uh, impact on them of the, of the war itself. So the first thing to say is that the countries that are neighboring Gaza, Israel and Egypt, have an obligation to open their borders and let people who are fleeing for their lives enter. Not to do that of risks violating the principle of non-refoulement. When you have mothers with children who are trying to save their children's lives, Israel and Egypt need to open their borders and let that happen. But the Israeli evacuation order risks forcible transfer. Um, the Israeli military has called on half the population in Gaza in the north to go to the south. And Israeli military officials have also called on um, people in Gaza to flee to Egypt.
Now, for people in Gaza, Gaza is the 70 percent of the people living in Gaza are refugees from what is now Israel. Some of the older people who fled Friday, Saturday from northern Gaza to southern Gaza, they remember fleeing the Israeli army 75 years ago. They remember the homes they left behind in what is now Israel, and they remember that they were never allowed to come back, um, although international law defends the right of return for all refugees, whether they're Ukrainians trying to resume, uh, to, to return to areas that have been liberated from Russian occupation or under Russian occupation, or people from Gaza coming back after the army has left. My concern is that while it's, it's acceptable and in some cases advisable for warring parties to issue warnings, those warnings are only effective if there are safe ways for civilians to avoid harm. So when you tell, half, when you tell a million people to evacuate, but there's no safe place to go to and no safe way to get there, that's not an effective warning. And another thing that the, the United States government should do very clearly is to call on the Israeli government to cancel the evacuation order and to take all measures to protect civilians who remain in the north. There are many people, men, women, children, older people, people with disabilities, hospital patients, who either cannot or will not leave the northern Gaza, and they retain their protections under international law. And could you talk to us about how Palestinians in the West Bank are being impacted as a result of the uh, continuing uh, uh, the continuing conflict in uh, in Gaza? So here, people are mostly worried. Um, there have been road closures. Workers have not been allowed to enter Israel for their jobs. Um, there have been uh, increased military activity in the West Bank, including incursions and arrests. Um, you mentioned arrests of people who've expressed support for the attacks on October 7th. Businesses who uh, engaged in that have been closed at night with the Israeli army coming in. For the most part, people are worried. Um, all of this is unprecedented. The attacks that Hamas-led fighters committed against Israeli civilians on October 7th are unprecedented. It was the worst massacre of civilians in Israeli history. And the level of harm, targeted harm, that the Israeli military is inflicting on civilians in Gaza is also unprecedented. At Human Rights Watch, we're trying to hold open a narrow space for universal basic principles of humanity. It is never okay to commit unspeakable war crimes against civilians, as was done in southern Israel on October 7th, and that in no way justifies committing war crimes against civilians in Gaza. And for Americans who are confused by all of what's going on, I would suggest you just remember that very basic principle that civilians need to be protected and then encourage your elected representatives to remind the, Ameri the U.S. government of that principle. Because the United States government is providing $3.8 billion in annual military aid to Israel, and it's rushing even more weapons here right now. It has a responsibility to rein in the attacks on civilians, to call on Israel to cancel the evacuation order and protect civilians in Gaza, and to immediately restore humanitarian supplies to civilians. Can you talk about the difference between your experience on the West Bank and as, as an Israeli Jewish lawyer and your husband's experience as a Palestinian professor, a resident of Ramallah, for people to understand? And also this issue, you know, Jake Sullivan recently said, just a few weeks ago, Biden's national security adviser, uh -huh. that it's been quieter in the Middle East than um, any time in 20 years. This is the time that at least a Palestinian a day was being killed. And talk about settlers and the army. Yeah, I think part of the concern, and I know Raji was addressing that when he talked about root causes, is that some of the root causes of the violence, including what Human Rights Watch and many other groups have called apartheid, are invisible to U.S. policymakers. Um, we have a situation where U.S. policymakers are very busy brokering normalization deals between the most right-wing Israeli government in history and dictatorial Arab governments, and it's not paying attention to what's happening on the ground. 
For decades, the Israeli authorities have engaged in systemic repression of Palestinians, including not allowing people in Gaza, refugees in Gaza, to return to their homes in what is now Israel, and including a punishing closure for the last 16 years that has not allowed um, appropriate supplies to enter and leave Gaza and has not allowed people to travel. And that's part of the reason why people in Gaza were so vulnerable even before this violence began. In addition, the Israeli government is privileging Israeli Jews over Palestinians. And that's the essence of the crime against humanity of apartheid. When you um, commit inhumane acts and engage in systemic repression in order to privilege one group over another. So I'm, I'm Israeli Jewish, American as well. My partner is Palestinian. And I can do things that he can't do. Um, I can travel quite freely, and even though his mother is a refugee from what is now Israel, he can't pass areas that are off limits to Palestinians. I have um, excellent rights, I have health, there are cities in Israel being built for Jews only, and also in the West Bank, settlements being built for Israeli Jews only, while Palestinians are hemmed in, unable to build cities, and their homes are being demolished for lack of permits that are almost impossible to get. Um, the Israeli authorities are engaging in forcible transfer, where they remove Palestinian communities in the West Bank to make room for settlements. All of these are part of the root causes of the violence. And if the only thing I can hope is that U.S. policymakers will realize that uh, it's not quiet here. There's terrible abuses going on. You just have to listen to what people on the ground are telling you and adjust accordingly. No U.S. policy toward Israel-Palestine will be successful if it doesn't address the abuses on the ground, first, second, and third. Sorry, Bashi Wun. Thank you for being with us, Program Director at Human Rights Watch, co-founder of Gisha, the leading Israeli human rights group promoting the right to freedom of movement for Palestinians in Gaza.